What's cracking, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Bunk Bed Breakdowns. As you can see, I am not at the satellite offices of California BDG today because I'm out on vacation. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Lake Tahoe uh, with my girlfriend and, and one of our friends, just like hiking, you know, freaking, I don't know, shooting the shit, jumping around in the snow, making snow angels, whatever it is kids do these days in the wilderness. That's what we're doing. So I apologize in advance if the audio quality is not as good as normal. I'm basically rocking AirPods and a MacBook here. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had to get the show out. So obviously we weren't going to skip out on that. You know, every show, every week, every Wednesday, we're going to be there for you guys. And especially, especially in the Dynasty offseason, man, because this is when uh, things get super interesting. Uh, hopefully you guys have been watching the other videos that Noah and I've been putting out, but you'll get more and more like strategy, you know, data analysis type pieces going in the off season. Cause this is when we actually have time to buckle up and do a lot of the research, you know, get into the digits, get into the numbers, get into the film and get into everything about prospects, about next year's ranks, about, about, you know, the Godfather himself, about me, about Noah about Noah's mother who knows man we'll cover everything hey chill we'll out cover everything. <laughs> we'll cover everything all the family everything no man how you doing I'm doing all right man it's I saw that you're in Tahoe you got like good weather in California I look out the window it's like it's already dark and it's like five o'clock <laughs> there's snow on the ground it's real cold so I'm doing as well as any person could be doing in this type of weather but you know I was just saying I love the off-season content way more than in-season. Nick says it all the time. I think you say it as well because you're already on to like 2023 by now. You're basically Bill Belichick. But it really hits me like week three when I realize all my takes from the previous season were wrong. I'm like, all right, let's go to the off-season. Let me try to build up some more takes. And I think this off-season, I got to have some more tweets and takes that I can go back and uh, really stand in my own corner on, I guess. Because I look back and I didn't really have too, too many takes. It was like the first off-season that I did, like Dynasty throughout the entire off-season. I felt like instead of, like making bold takes. I just kind of put information out there and let you do with whatever you want to do with it. But I have been pinning some of them. And Mike, I got to read this one out because I found it and it's it's ridiculous that I tweeted this. I don't know when Darius Geis got in trouble for all that stuff. I thought it was way earlier than June 22nd, 2020, but I wrote heading into his age 23 season, Dalvin Cook had played just four NFL games. Darius Geis, who just turned 23 this past week, has played in five. His career is not over wrong his career is very much <laughs> over so i'm gonna be pinning those type of takes all off season i also have a carry on johnson one comparing him to dalvin cook that's gonna be up there in no time so um but kind of segueing into this video before we hit the intro we're gonna go over some of our best takes that we had this off season and kind of go through why we think we hit on them not just to run victory laps and be like oh i said jonathan taylor was good look how well he did against the jaguars to end the year like we all knew, knew jonathan taylor was gonna be good there's no point of like victory lap and those type of guys but uh, other players, like people that were going to regress and then ended up doing well, I feel like those are way more helpful to hit on. So before we get into that, Mike, I think you know what we got to do first. We're talking about your mom? <laughs> I right, we're out. <laughs> hit that intro, man. I mean, look, it's like Noah said, there's no point just victory lapping because we're right. What we want to do is cover interesting guys who, you know, we want to get into why we thought they were good, why we think we hit on them. We're not going to be victory lapping like accidental hits. And, you know, that happens sometimes where like people, people call their shot for all the wrong reasons and for whatever reason it works out. That's not what it is. We want to, we want to really kind of study the process of why we picked out some of these guys as like buy highs, you know, sell highs, whatever it is. Whatever we came to that result and whatever resulted in that victory, we want to understand why we got there. But more importantly, we want to talk about what it means going forward. Like, are we still in on them? Are we out on them? You know, what are the implications for Dynasty? Should you be trading for them? Should you be unloading them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's kind of the process we're going to go through. And we got quite a few of them because, you know, contrary to our own beliefs, we actually hit on a pretty decent amount of players and, and actually help people. Um win in the long run despite all the misses we had so you know let's get into it no why don't you kick it off with uh with your first one yeah my first one that I kind of was big on this offseason was Josh Allen just because what he brought to the table is something I look for in fantasy quarterbacks not only the Konami code that you've been tweeting about which is if you want to check out Mike's Twitter I'm sure you guys are following him he put out like a thread about how important running is for the quarterback position we knew what Josh Allen was coming into this season right we didn't know how accurate he was going to be but we knew he had the big arm to make those big plays 
They added a weapon like Stefan Diggs of Cole Beasley, and we saw what he did with John Brown his first year there. And we knew he had that rushing floor. So I was kind of all in on him, despite him still not being the most accurate guy, because of the jump he showed from year one to year two. I did not expect this jump from year two to year three. I don't think anybody did, so I'm not going to say that I was right about that. But heading to the year, I think I had him quarterback seven or eight just because I felt he could bring all those different fantasy relevant uh, positives to the table, whether it's running the ball, whether it's throwing the ball deep. And he really did bring that to the table. And what we saw in 2019 was this offense being built around guys who aren't 6'4", like Kelvin Benjamin, like what we saw they did in Carolina with Cam Newton when he had all those big weapons. He wasn't really as good as he my was girlfriend when... trying to sneak around this, trying to sneak around the bedroom, oh, trying to grab a pillowcase. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the longer hair between us. <laughs> I think you still got the longer hair. You might have my girlfriend beat. <laughs> and I know myself longer. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to I take it down and see what's going on. Now I'm leaving this all in there, Mike. We, we get to see you <laughs> hiding under the bed and stuff like that. No, but I was just all in on Josh Allen because he brought to the table everything that you've been recently tweeting about, whether it's running the ball and just taking deep shots and picking up those chunk plays. So I know I was a little bit higher on them than most. You were a little bit lower on him than most. But I think what we can take away from here is try to look at guys who are trending in the right direction, taking steps year after year. And I'm not saying this is a guy I'm going to go out and buy and I'm not all in on because we know his future. But I think somebody like Mitchell Trubisky, who at the end of this year kind of showed that he can lead an offense. They were scoring 30 points almost every single week. He wasn't like the most efficient or like the best looking quarterback out there. But I think if they bring him back next year, uh, Darnell Mooney is somebody I really like. I'm sure Allen Robinson's going to be gone. But I think that they have shown that they want to build a stable of weapons around him by bringing in a guy like Allen Robinson. They just signed Tariq Cohen for a while. So he's somebody that I think can get super cheap because there's so much spec. Uh, what speculation about him like leaving yeah. and not being re-signed so i think he's somebody you can buy super cheap for like a late second round pick in a super flex league and just throw that dart i'm not sure how you feel about that because it is super risky but uh, at this point i don't think i would rather have a guy like carson Wentz over him i think i'd rather take that shot on trubisky yeah that was a, that was a, i was just about to ask you like who would you rather have carson Wentz or mitchell trubisky i will say like trubisky you know the offense has looked pretty good down the stretch granted they're they're playing against bum defenses but the problem with Trubisky is like his, but it's like the same story as Josh Allen, right? That's the thing. It's like his advanced metrics just still aren't there. If you look at his like EPA, um, EPA per play, if you look at his completion percentage over expected, like he's still not a very good quarterback. But to your point, I think he's shown some signs of life and it just comes down to cost. I mean, if you're in the late second round, it really depends on who's there, right? Because like, I honestly think like you're going to be able to get someone like a, maybe a Deami Brown, right, in the late second round, maybe like an Elijah Moore. So would I rather have one of them or Mitchell Trubisky? It really depends on the team. Uh, but, like, if you want to grab someone, I mean, like, he could also – he's someone that could also, I feel like, garner some attention if he goes to another team. You know, mm -hmm. like, kind of like um, – even even look at Mariota. After how bad he was, he switched to Vegas. People were already talking about how he would replace Derek Carr. So – I think a change of scenery value bump is like, is pretty normal. I, I like, I totally whiffed on Josh Allen. So that was like a big, big hit for you. Like I'm coming from the number perspective. It was just like, it was damn near impossible to kind of see this type of like this type of transcendence coming. Like we just haven't seen it before. So that's why it's like a big shout out to guys. Like I guess Evan Silva, uh, you know, TJ Hernandez, the big names that were actually on Josh Allen pretty early as well. But, you know, I covered the Konami code stuff. It's, it's so crucial to just have that as a part of his arsenal. And now that we know Josh Allen has the throwing part of his arsenal as well, like, I mean, upside is, is, is pretty much, you know, uncapped for someone like him. And I think the one other thing that there that I totally missed was like, what the Bills did to like kind of build around him like year after year. Man, you know, I hope they get Brian Dable. That offense is it's ridiculous. Like nobody can stop them. I think if anybody's gonna beat the Chiefs in the postseason, NFC or AFC, I think it's gonna be the Bills because their offense can really go toe to toe with them. Yeah, yeah, their offense is uh, is lights out. I mean, man, kudos to the Bills. Just, just how they built that team, how they coached that team, how they, like, completely fucking abandoned the run when they realized the running backs suck and just put it all on Josh Allen's, like, arms and on Stephon Diggs. But, yeah, that was a, a big-ass hit. I mean, if, if you got Josh Allen, you profited. I mean, the only saving grace I have when it comes to Josh Allen is I drafted him and Lamar Jackson in a uh, 0 0.25 points per carry league. And I actually tried to trade in this offseason. No one wanted him, so I just kept him. And now, and now I'm just like kind of riding that wave. But yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. I think you know going forward on guys like Josh Allen, I mentioned this before. I, I will probably still miss on someone like him. Um, 
but I will pay more attention to the way the teams are building. I will say with the Bears, I don't really know how they're building the team. Like they, they're they not really setting players up for success the same way that the Bills are, so I'm a little bit more wary. But, you know, that's why he costs like a late second, maybe even a third-round pick he's probably got Mitch, Mitchell Trubisky for. Yeah, for sure. And I think two other guys that I was extremely low on, and I know one of them you for sure were also low on because we heard it in the comments. We got Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater. Now, <laughs> yeah. Drew Locke, I'm not going to get too far into it. The guy we knew stunk, and we saw that just because you have Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy who can't really catch a football, which is surprising to me because he did it like 200 times at Alabama, and because they had Noah Fant and because they had Melvin Gordon, we thought these weapons were going to propel him to be a top 15 quarterback. And by we, I mean like animal and then everybody in the comment section. <laughs> Same with Teddy Bridgewater, right? We saw Curtis Samuel there who was kind of breaking out last year. DJ Moore had a complete breakout. They added Robbie Anderson. They have Christian McCaffrey out of the backfield. What I kind of realized here, and I think we saw it in the past with the New York Giants when they had Saquon Barkley, Odell, Evan Ingram, Sterling Shepard, is just because you have a lot of weapons around you doesn't necessarily mean you yourself, meaning the quarterback, is going to become extremely fantasy relevant. People wanted to peg these guys as back-end quarterback ones, high-end QB2s because they have the weapons there. You got to realize, like, Carolina this year had three receivers go over 1,000 yards from scrimmage and Curtis Samuel, Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore. Teddy Bridgewater was the quarterback 20. We've seen this play out before, as I just said, with the New York Giants. So just because you have the weapons there, if the talent isn't there, which we knew it really wasn't with Drew Locke, and it was an extremely small sample, but we saw that it wasn't really there. Teddy Bridgewater throughout his entire career, like I don't know when the narrative of him being a good quarterback really came alive because even in New Orleans with that offense last year in 2019, he really had like one good game. Other than that, it was kind of really shitty for him. I think he's played like 60 games and has four multiple touchdown games back to back. So for fantasy, he's just like not a touchdown scorer. And I think we brought it up in one of the videos last year was why take a guy like Drew Locke or Teddy Bridgewater and a super flex dynasty startup over a guy like Tom Brady, over a guy like Drew Brees. That one didn't really work out. But when you think about it, right, Tom Brady has one or two years left in fantasy. I would much rather bet on Tom Brady's two years than what Drew Locke is going to do. Because the best case scenario is Drew Locke's like a five-year starter because we know the talent isn't there. But in those five years, how many times is he going to give you fantasy relevant performances more than what Tom Brady brought you this year, who is a complete league winner down the stretch or Drew Brees. I know he got hurt with injuries and stuff like that, but if he's back next year, I have no doubt that he's going to be better than what Drew Locke was this past season. So I think the point to take away here is twofold. I think just because you have weapons around you, if you're not a great quarterback, don't go out and try to buy them just because the surrounding cast is there. I know it can prop you up a little bit, but not really to the point where you're going to become elite because of it. And number two is don't always just draft the younger quarterback because you expect longevity whereas an older quarterback might have the exact same longevity and a higher peak despite being older so that's where I'm at with the quarterback position yeah I think the Drew Lock one is an important one I, I remember covering this one specifically in the offseason and I drew the parallel to Eli Manning because in Eli Manning's last year everyone was like well he has a wide receiver one ranked overall in OBJ he has a tight end one ranked overall in Evan Ingram a top five tight end a top five wide receiver he has a top five running back ranked in terms of Saquon Barkley, there's no way he's not going to be a QB1. What happened? He fucking stinks, and he was not a QB1. And How like, about Baker the, Mayfield the, the, last year too, right? With Odell, yeah. Jarvis Landry, Nick Chubb. Yeah, and, and the prod, the problem with that fallacy is, one, you're basing it on other people's ranks, which we know are grossly inaccurate, right? So that's just because someone ranked is a wide receiver one doesn't mean they'll finish there. And then the other part of it is, you know, th that that can create a mispricing in the market, right? Like when I look at that, I, what I, that tells me, is his, vet, his weapons are overvalued. It doesn't tell me that Drew Locke is undervalued. It tells me that his weapons are overvalued. And that's like that's the reason why we said to fade Drew Locke uh, because I just did, did not see it with him. And, and then also he didn't really provide you the Konami stuff. So like it, it, unless you are a Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers level player where you're passing for like damn near like 4,500 yards and 45 to 50 touchdowns, you are not going to have the upside as a traditional pocket passer. And even Tom Brady, a monster, monster season, like 40 touchdowns, like 4,500 yards, back end QB1. Like that's that's as good as you're going to get with those guys. So that's why with these young guys, you want the rushing upside. You want the Joe Burrows who who like got like 20, 22% of his production from rushing this year. And like that's the thing you want to focus on is Konami guys because even when they struggle, they, they can be mobile and they can provide you some production on the ground. But a guy like Drew Locke just just isn't that. If he's not if he's not throwing a bunch of touchdowns, he, he's more often throwing a bunch of picks. So he's just not really going to get it done for you. And I totally agree with you on the on the last point. 
And it kind of like bundles with one of my misses was like, Hey, I faded Aaron Rodgers. I thought he was too old, but the fact remains like even Aaron Rodgers in his like back half of his career is going to provide you probably more years of productivity than some of these young guys like Daniel Jones, uh, like, you know, Jared Goff, like all these younger guys. So I think it's a, it's a very good lesson to have. And it, it's why in Superflex, I'm okay with not going so heavy in quarterbacks that early because you'll always find guys like this for cheap. Like the Tom Brady's, the, the Ben Roethlisberger's in their late years, um, the Matt Ryan's that are coming up. They're not great, right? But they'll be a decent enough QB2, QB3 flex option for you. Um, but yeah, it's kind of wild. You know, Carolina Panthers had four players at 4,000 yards. Um, so there's the three receivers that, that you named and then also Mike Davis. Uh, but despite all that, you know, Teddy Bridgewater wasn't really a great quarterback in terms of fantasy. Mike, so. what if they trade up and get Justin Fields? I've been thinking about it. I think oh they're right. Dude, it would be right beautiful. Now. If they yeah. trade with the Jets and the Jets want to build around Sam Darnold, which I wouldn't hate just getting more assets. If they get Justin Fields, that would be unreal. I might just stack that whole offense, my whole fantasy <laughs> team. I'll even get fucking Ian Thomas out there. Like, <laughs> T Grizzly is going to be playing my tight end spot and I'll be fine with it, but that's going to be incredible. And, you know, another thing you just brought up, you brought up all these old quarterbacks. I think in hindsight, right, if we were going to go back, knowing what we know this season, how everything played out, and we did a dynasty startup, who would you rather take, Phillip Rivers or Drew Locke? Me, I'm taking Phil Rivers because I don't think Drew Locke's time in the NFL is much longer, and we saw what Phil Rivers did for you this year. He was a fine quarterback too. So I think yeah. – well, I asked you the question. I'll let you answer it, I guess. But Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would I would take – the only reason – I would take Drew Locke, and the only reason why I would take him is because I know I can sell him to someone. Mm-hmm. once he has a you're always game. finessing you're always out and here you, finessing, and you Mike. can't you can't sell philip rivers no matter what mm-hmm. philip rivers philip rivers could go up tomorrow and put up a qb1 performance overall and you would not be able to get like a late second round pick from him. that's just guaranteed that's the only reason why but if i was not able to trade then just in a vacuum of who i'd rather have on my team i would absolutely rather have philip rivers than, uh, yeah. than drew lock but just thinking about the trade aspect uh, I would I would prefer Drew Lock just because you know there's an animal in your league somewhere that you can kind of just take <laughs> to town and you know that guy exists in every single league and you can you can always grab him. Yeah, for sure. And I think unless you have any other quarterbacks to throw in there, I think we can pivot to. I, I have a quarterback right. that I want to throw in there, and it's the quarterback I always talk about. And I know you're probably on him too, but Ryan Tannehill. I mean, I've been pounding the drum for Ryan Tannehill ever since last season, and and. You know, I called it the he's too good to repeat discount because that's basically what it was. People were like, there's no way he can be this good again. And and like, look at, look at how bad he was in the Dolphins. Look how bad he was in Gase. Look how efficient he was last year. Like all the excuses you can throw out there, people threw out there and said, look, there's no way he'll be this good again. And what happened? He was that good and he was better. He's finished top 10 quarterback. He has a Konami code. Uh, he has his weapons, Adrian Brown. He even revived the career of Corey Davis. And he's only like 32. He's only four months older than Russell Wilson. So that's really big on. We just learned with Tom Brady and those guys, <laughs> they can't produce after the age of 30. Yeah, exactly. So if you're big on Russell Wilson, I mean, Ryan Tannehill is the discount Russell Wilson in every facet of the game. They're very similar in terms of their Konami production. They're both around 20% uh, of their pro- fantasy points produced via rushing. And, you know, they're, they're both like on low, va- low passing volume offenses, but highly efficient and high TD scoring. So they're literally carbon copies of each other, except one will cost you three rounds less than the other. And, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go all in on Tannehill again this year, depending on where ADP shakes out. Unless unless everyone somehow wakes up and finally listens to the tweets that I've been putting out about Ryan Tannehill, which I don't foresee happening because he's hit the 30s age, uh, he's going to be a discount and he's going to be a top target of mine. And you can get him as your QB too. And that's the cheat code. That's the ultimate cheat code is you can get him as your quarterback too but I will be comfortable getting him as my quarterback one as I did last year. Yeah. The only concern I have there, and it's not even too much of a concern because I think they'll just continue to build the offense the way that they have is one. If Arthur Smith goes elsewhere and becomes a head coach, because he is absolutely shown out as the OC there Mm -hmm. and two, pairing that if Corey Davis leaves. So if they lose their OC and they lose their wide receiver too, it might be a little bit iffy, but then again, we've seen, as you said, he can run the ball pretty well. I think in their last game, he scored a rushing touchdown, which Derrick Henry like could have gotten, but uh, he can run the ball. Well, he can throw the ball well, and they're just an efficient offense. I don't think, you know, Arthur Smith has been fantastic, and somebody put out tweets about, like, their former OCs and where they're ranked in terms of offense and then what happened once Arthur Smith started taking over. We also have to realize, like, Taylor Lewan was out this year, and I think the weapons that they have built and who they have drafted are guys that can win after the catch. And, you know, I've, I'm pretty confident that Corey Davis is going to come back. I feel like they like him there a lot. I know he went through, like, a bunch of up and downs. Like, if you look back at his 2020, there was those crazy stories. Like, his brother passed away, and he played the day after. He went through COVID. And I think before this past game, like, he had a kid. Like, he had a very – and then he, like, blew up this year. So, he had, like, a very eventful 2020. And I feel like just – 
the way he's grown in Tennessee and it seems like he's a fan favorite out there. I, I hope, and I think that he will be back. So I'm definitely not selling him. I am going to be just like you, Mike. And I want to be like Mike. I want to draft Brian Tano <laughs> as my quarterback too. I want to get that Konami code and a uh, quick question. So Konami, Konami code is 20% of your production coming from rushing, right? Or That's around. how I defined it. Uh, so other people define it as like someone that gets four carries a game that roughly works out to like mm-hmm. 60 carries. Uh, but I like to look at it in terms of fantasy points. So like anyone that's in that, so like Justin Herbert, he just missed the mark. He's at like 18%. So like, that's like a difference of like a rushing touchdown. So you, you call it 15%, whatever. I just call it 20%. How many of those guys were there in your database? Like eight or nine? This year? Seven, seven in 2020, including Man, Dak. Looking at 2021, just to bring it up, like Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. Yeah. Even Zach Wilson, I think might hit that because he, he's a guy that's not going to be afraid to call his own yeah. number on the goal line. Trey Lance, like, there's probably going to yeah. be like 12 guys that are in there. And I won't be surprised a few years down the road, all 12 of those are just the quarterback ones. Yeah. Joe, I mean, Joe Burrow was the QB 13 overall. He had 22% of his production. So he yeah. just barely missed the mark. And, and Gardner Minshew was QB 12. And he actually had less than 20%, which is not normal for him, but he had like 15%. Like Patrick Mahomes, I just 12% of his career. You need to have that aspect of the game. It doesn't, you don't focus on the 20%, but focus more on like just looking at that player and be like, hey, does this guy provide that rushing upside? If he does, check the box. Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, both check the box. Trey Lance checks the box. Like, I'm telling you, in, in a year or two from now, there's going to be, like, one guy in the top 12 that is not a Konami quarterback, mm-hmm. and it's going to be that guy that passed it for, like, 50 touchdowns, and that's it. Yes, yeah, me, Mac Jones. But talking about things, <laughs> <laughs> things that matter, right, running for quarterback matters, one thing that doesn't matter, and it never matters, not to say it never matters, but, like, regression right there was all these arguments last year about this player is going to regress somebody on twitter just came up to me and didn't come up to me but they tweeted at me like (laughs) aren't you worried james robinson's going to regress and i said regress to what he was a rookie what's he what's his career average career average is what he did this year like you brought it up and we i think it was one of the first videos we ever did was the goal line touchdowns and touchdown rate regression right and you said it's not fair to compare aaron jones to the league average when aaron jones has historically been really good at scoring touchdowns. And I know this year, I think he only ended up with 11 touchdowns and like eight were rushing. So he did regress from 19 to 11, which is kind of what we said. It's like, he's going to regress, but he's probably going to still be in the double digits. And then somebody like Leonard Fournette, who the thing is like, if you stink for the 340 touches, you're not just going to regress and be like, okay, now I'm going to be good because I 341 times I was really bad. Now I'll be good. I think what we learned is not to shit on analytics because it definitely has a place and it obviously hits because there is historical backing about it. But sometimes you have to take things into context, right? You can't be comparing Aaron Jones to league averages when he throughout his entire career has been way better than league average. You can't compare Leonard Fournette to league average where throughout his entire career, he's been worse than league average. And I think another one you brought up was Nick Chubb because his career average kind of went up and down and comparing him to the league average, you're like, okay, he's in a positively regress, which he kind of did this season because he was really good his rookie year and he kind of fell off his second year in the league. So it's more apt to compare a player's regression to their own averages rather than as the league as a whole. And I don't want to take this away from you because this was basically your findings from last year, but I think just it, it makes sense. There's a lot of common sense built into there. You can't compare a bum to a really good player and a really good player to a bum and expect those numbers to average out. Yeah, I mean, it's look like analytics, they have their place, right? Like, that's where I, I, I form the basis of a lot of my opinions. But, like, you know, I, ju- I literally just threw this out. Like, analytics is not dealing in certainties, right? When you look at a number, it's not telling you this player stinks, this player is good, this player is for sure going to be good, this player for sure stinks. What it tells you unless is, like, it's Henry Ruggs, then it's unless, yeah, unless it's Henry Ruggs, then he stinks. But it tells you, like, here's the range of possible outcomes. Here's what's most likely. And what's most likely is Aaron Jones will regress, but it doesn't mean that he will stink. Like he will regress, but he will regress to a point that's still well above average of the league. Going from RB2 to point. RB5. Wow, he stinks now. <laughs> yeah, like, come on. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's the thing is like, you know, you got to take numbers in context and try and like step back and think about some of the stuff. Cause honestly, like a lot of times it is just, it is just common sense. You know, it's like, it's like, hey, this player's really good. He's on a really good offense. They have a top offensive line. They run a decent amount in the red zone. Chances are he's going to have to score a shitload of touchdowns again. That's exactly what he did. And like that's the short double digit touchdowns to even play a full season. So, you know, it, it's just like you got to go back and just just really like really like dive into numbers instead of just being like, OK, well, this guy performed above the league average. Uh, therefore, he's going to fall back to, to the league average. It's like regression happens, but like it doesn't mean you sell. Regression doesn't automatically trigger a sell. Regression doesn't automatically trigger a player stinks. And conversely, it doesn't automatically mean a player that who stinks is going to be good. I mean, there's a reason why they sucked for a long time. And, you know, it's probably because they're no longer that good. So, I mean, if you look at, 
the Leonard Fournette curse case study. Like, you know, he had a great, great few years as a rookie, right? First three years absolutely is a hit from a rookie perspective. But then like, you know, you just got to kind of move on that, move off of that when like the team cuts you, you go to another team and the coach consistently says the other guy's going to start. And for some reason, like we're still tied to his like athletic, athletic ability and whatnot. So, you know, it's just like, you gotta, you gotta be able to take in that new information and move on day by day. Yeah. And building off of that, right. Analytics does have its place, but I also think film grinding, which you always refer to me as has its place as well. And I think a beautiful Absolutely. case study of that is Antonio, the God. Gibson. Oh yeah. Now we all heard the 33 carry narrative. Oh, we only <laughs> carry the ball 33 times in college. Guess what? Th- that turned into like 380 yards, like over 10 yards of carry. The guy was immaculate. And I remember doing the write-up in the draft guide, which you can buy. I'm not sure if it's like pre-order out yet, but it'll be bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKF probably. Um, the thing I looked at was, you know, there was only like three pieces of game tape. But in those pieces of game tape, it was all like five to ten touches, and he ended every game with like 300 yards. It was absolutely ridiculous. And just when you watch the guy play, this is what I mean by common sense, right? He's six foot. He's 230 pounds. He can play receiver. He can play running back. He's the most athletic running back in the class, even more so than Jonathan Taylor, Mm -hmm. basically on par with him. And then he goes to a team who picked him in the third round with beginning of the third round, the second pick. Yeah. Beginning of the third round with Ron Rivera as the coach, a guy who just had Curtis Samuel and used him in a dual skill set type of role. I mean, Antonio Gibson was always the play. And I think I even kind of made a mistake that after the NFL draft, I moved him down a little bit, even behind a guy like Zach Moss, because I'm like, okay, what I expected in the Bills offense, I think we all kind of expected was a good defense that would run the ball a lot. Zach Moss could catch and he was bigger than Devin Singletary. So we figured he'd have a better role. And I was convinced Zach Moss would be better than Devin Singletary. And I wanted to bet on that over Antonio Gibson, a Swiss army knife, kind of being good on a Washington offense that we kind of knew was trash. I think this just speaks to trust your eyes sometimes. And, you know, it's, it's hard to say fade analytics on a guy like Antonio Gibson because he is such an extreme outlier. But what I want to say here is, you know, throughout the entire offseason, you have a take on a guy and then you go on Twitter and there's differing opinions and you let those opinions switch your own mind. Not to say you have to be like steadfast in your opinion. You can't change and you can't be fluid. But I think for me personally, like I really like a guy like Devonta Smith and all these like BMI Twitter and uh, age Twitter and all this type of stuff. They're saying, he, he's not going to be good because of that. Me personally, not to say I don't agree with that or I don't believe in it because the numbers are obviously there. He's just going to be a guy that personally I'm going to die on that hill for because I think he's really good at football. He went to Alabama. He's outproduced basically every other first round receiver that's come out of there. And I'm going to die on that hill just like I kind of did with Antonio Gibson until that fat ass Zach Moss kicked me in the teeth. But uh, <laughs> I, I know you were high on Antonio Gibson too. Is that kind of where you were at? You're just like, okay, I'm going to believe what other people are saying and what I see with my own eyes about how athletic he is and what he can be at the next level. With Antonio Gibson, I think my view just like never really changed. Like even when he, when he went to Washington, I remember we were on the draft and, you know, at first we're like, oh, damn. And then I remember you and I like kind of just like talked ourselves into it. Like, you know what? He's got a pass catching role. He's got an opportunity. We don't know what Darius guys. He's never healthy. And I just like, I just talked myself into it. I just like held that view. And, but I think with Antonio Gibson, right? This is a very interesting case study for analytics. People think that he's not really an analytics guy. And, and it's true. If you, if you go with the, the typical analytical approach, like you're not going to hit on a guy that, like with Antonio Gibson. But here's where I differ from regular analytics when it came to Antonio Gibson. One, I was talking to Noah, talking to Nick. We were all three of us were watching uh, his film. And I'm not a film grinder, but my eyeball told me like, hey, look, this guy's doing some fucking whack ass shit that nobody else can do. <laughs> hey, like if you give him the opportunity, he's probably going to be pretty good. But second, when he, when he got the draft capital, which was basically second round draft capital, that was one thing that got me really freaking excited. And then two, he was the most athletic running back in the class. He was way more athletic than Jonathan Taylor because he offered a lot of other stuff. They both ran sub four fours at their size, which is just bonkers, bonkers. But then even on the analytics side, like his his broken tackles per touch uh, was insane. He like he was like the best in the yeah, class, and the reason why he won touches like thirty seven broken tackles. Yeah, he broke he, he every, every other touch. He broke a tackle. That, that's what mm-hmm. he was doing. He was breaking tackles, and then look what happened in the NFL. What does he do? He breaks tackles. Like that's all he does. And that skill is one that transfers. And the one, the reason why he was so exciting was because he also had the athleticism. He was not a David Montgomery where you break a tackle and you get tackled by the next guy. He mm-hmm. would break a tackle and be like 15 yards gone down the field. And that was exciting. But the other thing is it was all down to cost, right? Like what, where was he going? Like, I think big dogs, one of the first, we were the highest on him, at least the first to come out on him and be like, Hey, this guy's a top five running back in this class or top six running back in this class. Mm-hmm. And then 
where he was going was in the third round. And uh, when we saw that, we're like, hey, you guys need to fire the fire the bullet on Antonio Gibson in the third round every single time. The reason why is because once you're in the third round, analytics is out the window. The perfect analytical profile no longer exists. People are smart enough to have taken that guy in the second, in the first, whatever it is. So at that point, you are betting on an outlier to hit. If you get a hit from a third round, it is inherently an outlier. And the types of outliers that I like to bet on in those rounds are guys that we haven't seen before. I would rather bet on Antonio Gibson than like a Van Jefferson, right? Because he had a second round draft capital. Because we've seen all the profiles of Van Jefferson before and they all suck, all of them. None of them have succeeded. Not a single one has been that type of profile, unathletic, fifth year senior, never produced in college and stepped on the NFL field and produced, right? That guy, I think, Forrest Gump did it, but we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, there are no profiles like Antonio Gibson. The closest profile to Antonio Gibson, and we said this in offseason, was Cordero Patterson. And people would like to think that's a bust, but in my opinion, it's not because Cordero Patterson spent the early parts of his career pretending to be a wide receiver. The second that Antonio Gibson became a running back, I said, hey, we can now get to see what Cordero Patterson could have been had he stopped pretending to be a wide receiver and just acted as a running back, his true form out the gate. And that's why I was so excited about Antonio Gibson. And that's why I felt comfortable taking that lap because I felt like our process was good, right? The reason why we liked him was good. The reason why we told to we told you to grab him was good because of the cost. And then the result was good. So that's that's one I feel extremely comfortable uh, about from start to finish where I don't feel like we were wrong in the process and just got lucky. I feel like we were right in our process and the way we liked him. And, and then it ended up with an, a fantastic result because he is now – you know, basically a top six, top eight, top eight dynasty running back, right? You can't, you can't get him for anything less than two firsts. And what we told you to buy him in at was a third round pick. And even if you cash out in the middle of the year, you could have cashed out for a first plus. That's still a, that's still a win because you took out some of that risk. You know, you got that free first round pick and you get to re-roll again. So Antonio Gibson, man, just uh, probably one of the greatest hits uh, in BDG history all time because we had him as rb6 before the combine if i remember correctly yeah we did uh, and then he didn't really move because the top five kind of shuffled because of the combine yeah. in the draft, but he was right there he was right on everybody's yeah. heels because of it and i think just to put it extremely simply right if you're a a, a very athletic running back who can catch passes and then gets drafted mm -hmm. fairly high and has a path to touches like what more could you ask for and i think this year coming into the 2021 class there's that top two, maybe top three with Javante Williams. And there's a steep drop off. I don't know the athleticism of these guys. I don't have laser eyes and can like see a guy run. I'm like that's four, four, two <laughs> people that might be able to fit that type of mold, depending on the athleticism is Trey Sermon, who we just saw absolutely break out. And, you know, he did pretty well as a freshman. Then was kind of up and down. I transferred schools and I was at Ohio state doing really well. Uh, him, Kenneth Gainwell, I think can also kind of fit that mold who also went to Memphis and Ramondre Stevenson, I, this guy is like 240 pounds. I don't know how athletic he's going to be, but he can catch passes. And if he gets the draft capital and if he is not like Elijah Holyfield, then he's somebody I'd keep an eye on in a third round pick. Just draft a guy who is good at football. So that's where I'm at with those guys. And uh, more of a redraft take that I had. And I think I dubbed it the nostalgia tier of running backs. When you have a guy like Todd Gurley or Le'Veon Bell or James Conner, Chris Carson, David Johnson, Melvin Gordon, like my point going into the season, I think it was actually a redraft video. I was like, we've seen it before, right? James Conner and Chris Carson on the younger side, they've never finished a season. You're not going to invest a third round pick on a guy that you can't trust throughout the year. And guess what happened again? James Conner did really well to start the year. I think it was game one. Then he got hurt right away. Then he came back and he's mediocre. Chris Carson like didn't have a 100 yard rushing game. He was more of a receiving threat than a rushing threat this year. And then Gurley Bell stunk all season. And David Johnson basically blew up week one stunk and then did really well to end the season so i know you guys in the comments are gonna be like oh david johnson was actually really good because of your recency bias to what he did in week 17 when nobody was playing i think honestly it's again common sense a lot of fantasy football comes down to common sense like it's just a game played on a field a lot of people want to boil it down to like in-depth numbers when you're 27 and you sucked when you were 26 how many times have we seen a running back get older from sucking and then get better as they get older, like I just, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any running back who was good, stunk, got older, got better. Like, I just, it doesn't make sense to me. That's why I was off on Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell, and those guys. And, you know, these are people as well that people in Dynasty Startups, I can already see the questions. Oh, when are you going to take Leonard Fournette in this year's offseason? There yeah. could be a chance for him to start. How about James Conner? How about this? We've seen it play out. I would much rather take a shot on like an Antonio Gibson, who you could probably get in the 10th, 11th round of a Dynasty Startup last year rather than a Raheem Moster, rather than a Le'Veon Bell or a Todd Gurley, just because we know how that plays out. I'll take a shot on the upside any day of the week, other than the eventual and basically 
uh, known downside of picking one of these veteran running backs. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a running back dead zone, never fails. And it's why we say you go running back early because in the running back dead zone is where you get like wide receivers. So yeah, you just you just fade those guys. I mean, someone asked me on Twitter today, like, hey, who would you rather have for depth between Fournette and Connor? I said, neither. And I, like I said, no. <laughs> like, this is, there's no, there's no choice there to be had. Like, go with someone else. Um, that that's that was like a strategy victory lap. And the, the counter side of that is like the core of the dynasty startup strategy, which we all put together um, in the Bible last year. And it was fading wide receivers early and hitting wide receivers in the middle. And if you follow that draft strategy, that draft blueprint, you most likely succeeded because your wide receiver ones are guys like Ridley, DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, all those guys in the middle rounds. Right. And then you would have gotten, gotten like some stud wide stud running backs early or stud quarterbacks early, whatever it is. I think that strategy is going to probably continue into this next year. You're going to have deep wide receivers again. So yeah, those two pieces like fade old running backs and draft young wide receivers in that zone. Every time, every year, you will succeed if you just follow that simple, simple blueprint because there's always someone in your league that thinks that this is the year that you're going to have an old aging running back flip the script and become good again. And it's just, it, it like rarely ever happens. Yeah. And a guy that we were both out on or both in on in that running back dead zone at wide receiver that I think next year is probably going to be a seventh or eighth round pick again. It's Tyler Boyd. I know T Higgins is elite and that's a guy that you were completely right on was T Higgins. But Tyler Boyd, what else does he have to do to get the damn respect he deserves? I know he was hurt this year. I think he finished just shy of 1,000 yards from scrimmage. I know in the last game, Brandon Allen went like eight for a million with like a zero quarterback ratings, which didn't help him at all. But the guy's what, 25, 26 years old. He has that college profile, which to this point, his NFL NFL career doesn't really mean much. But two years in a row, he had like, I think, 1,000 or 1,100 receiving yards. He catches like 90 balls a year. He's extremely, he's a very big target hog. I think he was like seventh in targets last year. This year is well on pace to be top seven, top eight again before his injury. And even if T Higgins acts as the one, I think it's a 1A, 1B situation for as good as T Higgins is. I think Tyler Boyd is right behind him and playing that big slot role with Joe Burrow, hopefully healthy next year with no more AJ Green pretending to be a wide receiver in the NFL. I don't see a reason to fade Tyler Boyd and he's just perennially going to be a wide receiver 24 or better top 24 wide receiver if he's healthy and I have no doubt in my mind that he's going to be a seventh eighth round pick just like Robert Woods probably will be next year as well so just draft a guy like Tyler Boyd in that range and profit off of it because when you see consistency you just got to bet on it especially when they're young and you know there's nothing really to take away from here there's no like strategy I put into it I'm just like hey this guy is young he's been good in bad situations he's in a better situation why would he get worse and that's exactly what happened this year and it's going to continue to happen with Tyler Boyd. Yeah, Tyler Boyd's interesting. I mean, you know, that kind of parlays pretty perfectly into T. Higgins. Is high on T. Higgins all offseason. Uh, I think, you know, I'd, I'd actually prefer him to Jared Judy. And, you know, he's, he's just like a – it's just one of those cases where he's just a great prospect and he was going in the second round and because of a deep class. And you're going to have that again this year because what's going to happen and it happens every single year – is people go with like the BPA, like I want to draft the best player available and it's a wide receiver. And they're going to take the wide receiver early on. They're like, fuck, I have no running backs. Let me reach for this running back in the back part of the first. And then you're going to get guys that fall to the second round, guys like a Deami Brown, you know, who, who like kind of like fits that mold um, in terms of the value. And like, that's what I saw in T Higgins. Like when people were drafting Keyshawn Vaughn. I'm like, fuck that. I'm going to go for T Higgins instead. And it's, it's worked out pretty nicely. I think that offense is very dependent on Joe Burrow because it kind of collapsed a little bit without Joe Burrow. Uh, so I think Tyler Boyd also collapsed a little bit without Joe Burrow. So he's very dependent on both of them. But I do think that offense can provide two, two valuable, like top 24 wide receivers in Higgins and Boyd with a healthy Joe Burrow. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that Bengals offense can be something that can be explored going forward. Uh, you know, Tyler Boyd will be a value. You mentioned Robert Woods will be a value because he's only getting older, but he's going to be a mid-round, middling wide receiver two, friend wide receiver one. Every single time they extended him, they want him. He's the most versatile wide receiver in that offense. Uh, so, you, I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to wait on wide receiver again. I'm going to wait on wide receiver again. I'm going to get someone. I'm going to get a young person, someone like a Tyler Boyd, and then I'm going to get a older one, someone like a Robert Woods, and that'll be my wide receiver two, three flex. And then I'll grab someone younger early on to kind of build my future around. And that's kind of how, how I'll approach the draft. Like there's just, there's no reason to draft a wide receiver early again, because the, the running backs, the running backs, although albeit are a little bit deeper with the influx of talent here, 
from the 2020 class, but you still just need stud running backs to win. I mean, you can always get these wide receiver twos in, in the later rounds uh, without fail, man, every single year. Yeah, and I assume, Mike, for your rookies this past year, for wide receivers, you'd probably rank them Justin Jefferson, C.D. Lamb, then T. Higgins, right? Yeah, I have it. Yeah, Justin Jefferson, just phenomenal year, rookie seat, rookie year, 1,400 yards, probably unattainable now. So mm-hmm. don't even bother trying to trade it for him. And then C.D. Lamb, and then I have T. Higgins. But I also have Brandon Ayuk really close, mm-hmm. someone that I someone that I was uh, not as high on coming into the year, but he's been fantastic, easily leaps Rager. And then I have Chase Claypool uh, following him as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very, very, very good class. And you got LaVisca Chanel in there as well, who actually came up. So just like, just look at the running back and wide receiver talent alone from this year. Like I'm going to have probably four to five rookie wide receiver, not rookies, like a sophomore wide receivers in my top 20. And mm-hmm. I'm, I already have like four rookie running backs in my top 10. So it's, uh, it's future's bright, future's bright yeah. at the skilled positions. I have a question for your top three, right? And I'm kind of struggling with this too. Is C.D. Lamb closer to Justin Jefferson than T. Higgins is to C.D. Lamb? Like, is the gap bigger between one and two or two and three? Uh, there isn't much of a gap between any of them because I'm, I'm assuming Joe Burrow comes back and I'm assuming Dak comes back. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think Dak with Lamb and also Gallup. I don't – I'm not expecting Gallup to be there you know, in, in the Cowboys uniform next year. But even if he is, it doesn't matter. I mean, C.D. Lamb had a fantastic year as well. So – I think I think the gap between Lamb and Higgins is. Oh, I'll put it this way: I think the talent gap between Lamb and Higgins is much smaller than the value gap, which is why T. Higgins mm-hmm. is like my yep. top buy target because I think you can acquire from cheaper, and the talent gap really isn't that big. And they're both coming off of like injured QBs, and they're both getting their healthy QBs back presumably next year. So that's kind of how I view it. I would say like, but in terms of like how close they are, I view them pretty closely. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to get at, and you hit the nail on the head, because I think perception is because he plays on the Cowboys and he's an extremely versatile weapon. He's that big slot is I think CeeDee Lamb seems to be a more coveted asset because he broke out early on. Oh, yeah. And he, yeah, he continued <clears throat> to be kind of consistent in the face of terrible quarterback play after Dak went down. But you look at T. Higgins, he fin- finished just shy of a thousand yards from a uh, thousand receiving yards. Probably if Brandon Allen doesn't suck that last game. And if he doesn't get hurt, he hits that mark. And I honestly think like T. Higgins, I think of my wide receiver 12. I could see him next year jumping into the top five and I'd be like, yeah, T Higgins is a top five dynasty receiver. And I was, you know, I was completely wrong on him. I think Nick and I had a little bit fun saying how bad he actually was. I think he's like my wide receiver six heading into the class. And then after the combine and stuff, he was around six, seven. So as long as I was saying, don't ever draft him. I think I took him in a few leagues, but honestly, just what he's shown this year and how, how much better he looked than I thought he would be. And in the face of terrible situation, AJ Green getting like 12 targets a game to start the season. I honestly think he is still as a wide receiver one being undervalued. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head saying that like, he's still a buy despite his high price tag. I would pay up to like the one Oh five ish rookie pick in him because other than, you know, I really like Rashad Bateman. Other than him, Jamar Chase, maybe Devonta Smith, that's iffy. I don't think there's another receiver in this class I would take ahead of T. Higgins going forward in Dynasty. I think I would I would only take Jamar Chase uh, mm-hmm. over him because he's already produced. So I, I, I always value produce production over like a prospect because a prospect can always bust uh, regardless of whatever analytical model you want to throw on them. But T. Higgins has already produced, so I'm always going to give that a premium. And he's still young. So uh, I agree with you. Like other than Jamar Chase, I, I, I'm happy – if I'm on the clock and I'm at like 1.06, Jamar Chase off the board, uh, QBs are off the board, Najee, you know, Etienne off the board, I'm going to be like, hey, do you want T. Higgins for this pick? And they can take their Devontae Smith. They can take their whatever they want to take. I don't care. Uh, whoever they like, because I'm, I'm happy building my core of wide receivers around a T. Higgins for many, many years to come. Yeah, and if you were to build your core around Henry Ruggs or Michael Pittman or Van Jefferson, who we named early in the show, three guys that we were not high on at all, then you'd be in a really dark place right now, just like I was throughout this season being a Chargers fan. And, you know, I know the analytical profile for Henry Ruggs wasn't really there. And then people are like, oh, he's super athletic. He had big hands for whatever that means. I think this kind of this profile with Henry Ruggs and Antonio Gibson's profile kind of not contradict each other because you did say like Antonio Gibson was extremely athletic and that's a huge part of the running back position. But if you were just to say, Oh, trust your eyes, you probably like both Antonio Gibson and Henry Ruggs. But I think the wide receiver position, as we've seen is more prone to hit with analytics. It seems to be more predictive and more productive to rely on analytics when all you're relying on is your eyes. And I think also beyond that, like Henry Ruggs was never the most productive guy at Alabama. He was barely ever. I don't think he was ever like the number two guy because even no, 
his second year, Jalen Waddle as a freshman outproduced him. Then he was like the fourth most productive guy as a junior. I just, I never got it with Henry Ruggs. And then he went to an offense that had an established weapon like Darren Waller, who was going to fall off because they added fucking Jason Witten's 48 old year old ass. And then an established running game. He's somebody I wasn't high on. You weren't as well. Same with Michael Pittman. And my outlook really hasn't changed on Pittman despite a few blow up games. I'm like, what's the quarterback position going forward? He broke out as like a senior and I'm not, I wasn't high on him. And then Van Jefferson, uh, you talked about it earlier. An old guy who isn't fast and isn't productive lands on a team with two wide receivers much better than him and if cooper cup i think he already got extended like they both got extended yeah why would you why would you ever take van jefferson it it just never made sense the thing with rugs and Pittman, right like the difference is they both cost you a first round pick or at worst a early Mm -hmm. second round pick that is the difference between betting on an outlier there versus betting on an outlier and Antonio gibson in the late second and early third is the cost because if you cannot you, you with my first round picks I'm trying to be, I'm trying to make good bets, right? You know, third round picks, whatever, You're, whatever hit is an outlier anyway. So you can, you can throw the darts, do whatever it is. You like Chase Claypool, go for him. If you like Van Jefferson, you know, you probably suck at fantasy football. So, <laughs> but if you like, if you like guys go for them in those rounds, but don't do it in the first. That's why I was off of Henry Ruggs. I'm like, dude, there's too many film grinders. that love Henry Ruggs and he's going to go in the first round. And then there's no way I'm going to take him in the first round. That's why it just comes, it comes down to cost, right? Not to like anything else. It, it, it always comes down to cost. Like you got to take analytics as one thing. You got to take cost as one thing. You got to take film as one thing and pe- like group everything together and then form a rational opinion on why you like a player or not. And you know what? You'll be wrong. I'll be wrong. No, we'll be wrong. But at the end of the day, like have some of that process in there versus just being like, oh yeah, I can tell that Henry Ruggs is fast and he can dunk the basketball. Therefore, <laughs> you know, he's going to be good in the NFL. Like that's not how it works. Um, but yeah, that that's like, that's really the lesson learned there is to, you like analytics as a tool. It's just one tool in the toolbox you can use. And I'll, I'll, pull, I'll put up some videos uh, down the line on how to like calculate some of this stuff. I know you guys have asked for that. Uh, I'll put that on like a market watch Monday or something, but it's just, it's just one tool, right? Right. Like Noah watches a lot of film, you know, he relies on the numbers. I rely on the numbers. I, you know, I rely on them for film. Like, so it's like, you got to take all these things in. You can't just be one or the other. Like if you're just a film grinder, I've yet to see a film grinder that only grinds film and is, is successful all the time. I've yet to see an analytics person that doesn't do anything with film. It doesn't understand football that is successful all the time. You got to like take things in context and do both things. Like that's why, you know, I try and incorporate everything into my process, including film, even though I'm not doing it myself, I'm relying on someone, someone that does it as an input to my process. So I think that's really the key takeaway is you got to be balanced. Don't, don't mm-hmm. just be like a, don't be the film grinder that falls in love with Henry Ruggs on film and then ignores everything else and tells you he's not going to be successful. Yeah. And I think another guy that we both hit on, and it wasn't really like a hit because it was speculation. And I think it was a video. It's like the best value picks that you can get in the draft. Darnell Mooney. I think, I think I originally brought him up just because I was looking at analytics solely, which I don't typically start off with. I kind of want to see how a player plays first and then look at the numbers. If they correspond to what I think I see out of the player. Darnell Mooney, I saw he broke out a really early age. He had a crazy college dominator. I'm like, all right, let's look into this. He played at, I think, Tulane, like a really small school. And he was extremely dominant. Then I watched the film like, okay, this kid's really good. So then I kind of talked to you about him. You looked at his numbers. You're like, okay, he checks out. We kind of touted him as a guy. Pick him in the fourth round because nobody else probably knows his name. And he has as good a chance as any in that round. Like instead of taking was his name hunter bryant the guy that was doing like military presses on the blocking <laughs> thing in the in the combine instead of taking a tight end who got drafted to wasn't he drafted on the lions a team that just took yeah. a tight end like top 10 instead of yeah. betting on a position that's extremely hard to hit on uh on a team that already has hit on a guy of that position take your chance on mooney who has a legit chance to the wide receiver two job i remember arguing like he's basically taylor gabriel 2.0 that spot is now open. Anthony Miller is not it. They just drafted Cole Komet. So obviously they want somebody to help them in the receiving game. And why not just take that chance on Darnell Mooney? I'm not saying that this is a foolproof process every year. Just be like, okay, this guy looks pretty good. His numbers are good. Fourth round pick. Let's just burn it and pick a guy like this. But I mean, when everything kind of checks out and there is a path to targets and path to touches in an offense that lacks weapons, like Darnell Mooney was in the situation to be. I mean, why not just take that chance in the fourth round? As you keep saying, like it all comes down to price who what would you rather bet on a guy whose profile matches basically what Deontay Johnson was coming into the year who you've drawn that comp a ton or a bum tight end who wasn't even really that great in college who had no draft capital and only has like somewhat athleticism to bank on yeah that was I mean look I, I've said this multiple times as well like I spend 
I spend basically no time at all on sleepers because I think it's I think it's a total fucking waste of time. Yeah, I think uh, that video, because, honestly, going into it, we just looked when a playerprofile.com. We saw who's athletic and who had good yeah. like breakout ages. Yeah, exactly. Like it's just like you know, people used to go out there and grind like five hours of film on this like no name receiver from a no name school, and the guy doesn't get drafted, doesn't get put on the team, and he's wasting five hours of your life. That's why I don't. That's why I don't go after sleepers at this point in the draft. I think it's way more important to get the top of the draft right. Having said that. We came out with Darnell Mooney because, like, his analytical profile really popped. And then when I told I asked Noah, I was like, hey, like, have you seen this guy? And Noah was like, yeah, I watched him. He looks really fucking good. I'm like, okay, well, hey, like, you can do worse than having good film and having a really good analytical profile at the wide receiver position with the opportunity. And what he's done this year has been really, really impressive based on, based on like, what, what investment the team had him. He has 98 targets on the year, right, 600 uh 631 yards so he's not a bum like he's been startable in some weeks and you know he got the line share of the work he surpassed uh i think i did a i crunched the numbers and he surpassed uh, anthony miller at some point i think in like game seven or game eight he took over in snaps and anthony miller is strictly a slot wide receiver darnell mooney was a wide out and if you saw if you watched him like i i got so tilted there's no player i got more tilted this year watching than Darnell Mooney because every time Monday night football game we were recording during it and Nick Foles missed him on like three throws I think it was against the Dude, Rams too like he yeah. burned Jalen Ramsey a few times he he put Jalen Ramsey on skates and you constantly see him with like two or three steps ahead of his defender and Foles just like fucking throws it over his head <laughs> and throws it out of bounds and like, I was just so tilted I had so many tweets you go back in the season just me being like please free Darnell Mooney because that's what we want to see but he is from what I've seen, he's been the real deal. I made the comp to Deontay Johnson because I think stylistically they're very similar. They're both very good route runners, tiny dudes, uh, tiny, tiny dudes uh, who kind of just put defenders on skates and, and win at separation. But also, Donald Mooney is, is pretty good in contested catch. I mean, I've seen some highlights on him uh, just catching the ball in traffic. He's been really good. We don't know where Allen Robinson is going. I, I always try and fade the, hey, like, let's buy wide receiver X because wide receiver Y might leave. So that's like never really that much of a consideration for me. But what is the consideration is Darnell Mooney is good, right? He is a good player that has earned targets in the presence of Allen Robinson already. So if Allen Robinson leaves, then that opportunity will naturally fall to him because he is good to, to be able to actually capture that opportunity. So I think he's a, uh, we don't tell sleepers much, right? I, I literally spend no time, no time on sleepers at all. That was like the one of like two sleepers. If you can count Antonio Gibson as a sleeper, that was like the only, tw- the only sleeper we touted and, he was my most owned player across all my leagues because he was free. I had him in like 70% of my leagues uh, and, you know, it worked out. So I'm excited to see what happens with him. What would you pay for him right now? Would you, would you pay like a couple thirds? Would you pay a late second? Like what, what type of value are you looking at? for? Darnell? Yeah, I pay a couple thirds because I think that's all it's going to take. I think a second round pick, if somebody sees in their inbox two for Darnell Mooney, they're going to smash accept. So I think if you could throw out one third out there, they'll probably counter with like a third or maybe a fourth. You can go grab him depending on how deep into the numbers somebody really is. And if they knew how good he was coming into the league with the whole analytical profile. But honestly, I think he's somebody that, and I've been trying to do this, He's somebody you can throw into a deal, right? If you want to move yeah, yeah. back a little bit out of position, maybe you want to trade. I, I don't know how people value Kyler Murray versus Deshaun Watson, but if you want to trade Kyler Murray for Deshaun Watson plus Darnell Mooney or like Josh Allen for Herbert and Mooney. I know I'm pretty high on Herbert, but like something like that, or even a positional type of swap that isn't a quarterback, like a wide receiver, like maybe Allen Robinson for Galladay and him. I think he's just somebody that you can throw into a deal who's not going to make the other – owner on the other side of the trade be like no I don't want to do it because I'm giving up Darnell Mooney they'll be like okay I'll give up this fringe piece to make an upgrade whereas you can really hit on another Deontay Johnson and I like that comp as well because you said you know I don't want to bet on Allen Robinson leaving for him to produce in this offseason there was a lot of talk about Juju Smith-Schuster leaving and that's what would help Deontay Johnson he stayed and he was still better than Juju Smith-Schuster so not saying Darnell Mooney would be better than Allen Robinson next year if Allen Robinson stays I actually think having an alpha receiver will help Darnell Mooney not get all the coverage on the other side of the field but I, I do think the talent is there, as you said, and I think he's somebody that if you throw him into a deal, it can't really hurt you because moving from like wide receiver 12 to wide receiver 15 isn't going to be too much of a difference. It's going to be like point one points a game. And then if you hit on a guy like Mooney, it's only going to help your team with depth and more elite pieces on your squad. 100% agree. Yeah. Do you have anybody else that you hit on? Like I have a Brandon Cooks one, but there's not really like much to hit on there. Uh, so like he had one down. I have like questions. I'll just cover the tight end position. Like I was, I've been like a Darren Waller fan um, mm-hmm. ever since going in the off season. And, you know, we covered the rookie wide receivers. Like Darren Waller came off of what I would say, like 
maybe top 10, like one of the top 10 greatest seasons of all time by, by a tight end. I mean, from an efficiency perspective, he was absolutely like, he was a baller. Uh, and if you look at it, I think, let me just pull up the stats here real quick. He had, so he's 10th in yards since 2000, in the last 20 years, fourth in catch percentage since 2000, last 20 years, top 10 in yards per outrun among all receivers, that's tight ends, receivers, you know, running backs, whatever. And in this off season, he was going as a tight end seven. So to me, that was an easy smash. Where was you Tyler Higby going? Like tight end eight? Yeah, like one or two after him or something like that. And you had like Noah Fan going ahead of him. You had Peter Hawkins going ahead of him. Uh, Mark Andrews going ahead of him. A couple of other ones. But like, to me, that was just like such an easy smash. And I know everyone thinks that like, there was only like three tight elite tight ends. And then after that, you have to fade it and go super late. Like the hitting on late round tight ends are, are not, it's not freaking easy. It's not easy to do. Every year it's hard. That's why it's freaking like impossible to get that position right. And like here we had a target hog and everyone wanted to fade him because we had what two rookie wide receivers, some hunter run for splits, and Jason Witten. Like that, those were the those are the Almost top three. Three with Lynn Bowden Jr. going there in the third. <laughs> yeah. The, those are those are the reasons that people wanted to fade someone coming off of one of the best tight end seasons of all time. And he just put up another one. He put up another thousand yard season, set the Raiders receiving record. Like this guy is elite. He's in that tier, top tier with uh, Travis Kelsey and George Kittle. And, you know, I don't know if we'll be able to get him for value anymore. Uh, I'm sure most people already have him there, but I think that was one where the process seemed right. The production was there. And it was another one of those cases where people were like, man, he was like, he was too good. He was too good. There's no way he can do it again. And you can always find those types of discounts. And it's like, dude, sometimes the peel players are good because they are really, really good players. That's exactly what Waller is. Um, but just to piggyback off that, you know, I did pick one late round tight end target and that was TJ Hawkinson. That was like my one guy. I love, I know people love to do the spray and pray method. You go on Twitter. It's like, Oh, I think John Smith, Mike Isecki, TJ Hawkinson, Eric Smith, Ebron, all, all these frauds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're all, they'll all be really good late round targets. And then it's like, dude, dude that, that is not a take. Right. So my take for TJ Hawkinson was look, he's, he had a young tight end, a great profile. He had pretty decent production in his rookie year for a rookie tight end. And I was not a high on Kenny Galladay going into this year. He obviously got hurt. So that I was right for the wrong reasons there. Um, Marvin Jones was getting old. So I felt like there's going to be a lot of opportunity for him to grow into. And TJ Hawkinson ended up being a, yeah, he was a top five, maybe he's like top six now, uh, given that big stretch that Logan Thomas had down the stretch. But I mean, that was my one late round target and ended up hitting on that one. So I did pretty good on tight ends this year, I think. Uh, tight ends across my leagues really carried some of my teams, having a lot of Waller, having a lot of Hawkinson. Uh, but it's going to be another tough year, man. It's going to be another tough year for tight ends. It's fucking trash. It's trash every year. And I tweeted out, like, the difference between, on a points per game basis, between the top five tight ends and six to 12 is, like, four points per game. So, mm -hmm. like, we really need to redefine what a tight end one is. Honestly, it should really just be, like, the top three. Or, like, anyone that scores above, like, 14 points per game or something like that. Because, like, being a tight end one is is basically meaningless. You know, like, Mike Kosicki is a tight end one. Did he, did he win you anything? No, he fucking sucked. Like, Tyler Higby sucked. Like, all these, like, friggin' Hayden Hurst had, like, two games to give you zero points. Like, these guys, these are all tight end ones, but they're not going to help you at all. Even, like, week, Robert so. Tanyan, I think he finishes, like, the tight end four. But if you started him every week, I know he had this crazy stretch down the end of the year. But, like, he had a three-touchdown game. You were probably starting every week after that, and he just dudded out every single week until, like, week 12 or something. So, yeah, you're completely right. Other than, basically, Mark Andrews down the stretch, Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller, you're throwing out a bunch of shit. You're hoping something sticks. <laughs> And that's what worries me a little bit with Kyle Pitts because we all know the talent is there. He's basically a wide receiver. The draft capital is going to be there. But there's always that history of, like, tight ends never hit their first year. Even yeah. the TJ Hawkinson who blew up his second year uh, relatively, right? It, it's so hard to be, like, you're at the 108 and you see a Rondell Moore. You see maybe a Javante Williams there. You see other elite receivers. And you see Kyle Pitts. And you're like, this guy's really good. But there's a T and an E next to his name. I don't want to bet on him because it's hard to hit. But guess what? If he yeah. has like an 80% of what Darren Waller's been doing, I know that's pretty lofty. Even like 60% of what Darren Waller's been doing, like 650, 700 yards as a rookie, you're not going to be able to buy him at all. So I'm going to have a struggle this offseason planting my flag in Kyle Pitts because I know when the time comes and I'm on the clock, probably not picking him when I know I probably should. But at the same time, maybe I shouldn't because we've seen in the past how tight ends don't really hit. And we see a guy like Justin Jefferson at the 111, 112 jump value of guys way ahead of him because he's a wide receiver that has given more opportunity than most tight ends are. So I'm going to be battling with that, that uh, this offseason. I know you've already hit on that as well, but 
Um, I think the tight end landscape is with a guy like Noah Fant kind of showing out with TJ Hawkinson showing out, obviously the top three or four guys that were already there. I think the tight end one conversation will go from like three, the top three to like the top six guys. And then seven through 12 are going to be like fake tight end ones that you call a tight end one at the end of the year. And it's like, Oh, like Jason Witten was a tight end 12 in 2019, <laughs> putting up like two catches a game. So it's a shitty position, but I think it's, it's trending a little bit more in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's some, some good young talent there. And that'll be a battle I have too between like Kyle Pitts. I'm just, I, I've basically resigned to the fact that I'm not going to land in Kyle Pitts and tight end premium because I think people are going to just grab him in like the top three, top four pick. I'm just not willing to do that. So I'm going to try and look for places where I can grab him with like the 1.10 something like that, you know, after a couple of top wide receivers are gone, I'll, I'm willing to take a shot there. But for the most part, yeah, I'm probably not going to have much exposure to Kyle Pitts either. It's just yeah. the hype is too much and just the position, like, I mean, I'd say, like, in the last, like, couple of decades, like, the best rookie performance ever was by, like, well, maybe Rob Gronkowski because he had, like, and he only had, like, 500 yards, but he had, like, 10 touchdowns, right? And that that puts you into that elite upper echelon, but just, like, very few guys. Like, if you look at all the elite guys, like Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, et cetera, like, none of them were extremely productive from like an absolute perspective in their rookie year, which is why even after the season that Hawkinson had, which was pretty good for a rookie, like people were down on him because people are not as patient. So if you're not the type of guy that's willing to wait like two to three years and you shouldn't be, um, then, you know, you shouldn't really be investing that much in the tight end that early. Yeah, I just looked at Jimmy Graham, like 350 yards. Eric Ebron, who was like a top 10 pick at 250 yards. It's a really hard position to hit on. Maybe because he is more of a wide receiver, he'll be used more early on. But I'd probably just rather bet on a sure thing in a running back or a wide receiver. And that take right there will probably be on next year's worst takes because I know Kyle Pitts <laughs> doesn't go crazy and absolutely kick me in the face just like Zach Moss did as well. Yeah, uh, I think that's all that's we awesome. got for the victory parade. Hopefully you guys had some takeaways there that you can kind of implement going forward. We know, you know, we'll be analyzing our stuff. Uh, we'll be scrutinizing our mistakes uh, more so than our our, uh, our successes as we go on and try and like constantly evolve that process and get better. Um, so yeah, just stick around, man. Stick around. We'll be, we'll have like rankings talk, we'll have strategy talk, we'll have all that stuff coming up, you know, between Market Watch Mondays, this, um, all the other stuff that we've been, we've been launching out there. Uh, there's going to be a lot of analysis coming our way in the off season. Just make sure you stick around. If you liked, subscribe like hit that thumbs up uh helps us more than you know drop in the comments what you want to see what you want to know what you want to learn this is a platform for learning and shitty takes so yes, those sir. are the two things we prioritize the most so we'll get that to you guys and <laughs> Mike, follow me what do you, what do you think Noah. about a first round rookie mock draft next week <laughs> it'll be a total fucking waste of time but i'm down for it yes sir. <laughs> total waste of time but i'm, I'm down for it because uh, it's fun it'll give you it'll give us a chance to talk about the players we like who we don't like um so that'll be good i mean i already launched like my cornerstone rankings for quarterback so you know this will give you some insight into how we view rookies so let's we'll definitely do that and we'll probably incorporate some strategy and player analysis as we always do uh but yeah man until next time